What's up, guys? It's your boy Omni Sensei back with part 12 of What If A Serial Killer Reincarnates in Naruto as Blind Swordsman. If you enjoyed this series, drop like down below. It only takes a second, and it's free, and while you are down there hit that subscribe button. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Having said that, let's get into it. POV narration. Ken cracked his neck as he stood in front of the classroom. The podium in front of him was filled with blank pages, as usual. They weren't blank per se, but nothing could be seen with the naked eye. This was optimal, as Ken had no eyes, naked or otherwise. But despite being empty, the pages were also fully written. Within Ken's mind were drawn countless theories about the ways he could go around to teach his students about natural energy. Plenty of thoughts and experiments he wanted to run were laid down on those papers. The reason why they were empty was quite simple. Invisible ink. Not just that, Tasho had gone out of his way to seek out and create a form of ink that could be felt when being infused with chakra. It was actually quite expensive to make, and chakra metal dust was used during the creation process, but it was a rather great tool. One couldn't really see what was written when the paper was infused with chakra, but they could feel it. The normal shinobi would still have trouble reading something through his chakra, but to a sensor like Ken, it was child's play. Jiraiya still didn't realize what was going on, so to him seeing a blind child sift through a stack of empty papers in front of a full classroom was still jarring. The rest of the children didn't seem to pay any mind to that anomaly, they just quietly waited for their teacher with smiles etched upon their faces. Jiraiya couldn't help but sweat at that scene, it honestly felt as if the children were well and truly brainwashed. He had yet to meet one of them that had any semblance of a negative emotion towards the Dark Brotherhood or Ken himself, and that was a tad concerning. To any outsider who hadn't spent enough time there, the young members of the Dark Brotherhood sure seemed to be brainwashed. No one could blame an outsider for making that mistake. Kazu had also thought so at first. But he did realize at some point that there was no brainwashing within the Brotherhood. They're just being treated well and are acting accordingly that was the conclusion that the Uzumaki Seal Master had reached after all the time he had spent within the Brotherhood. Of course, Jiraiya didn't really think that Ken was the one pulling the strings in that sense. He may be strong, stronger than anyone here, but I doubt he is experienced enough to pull something like this off, maybe one of the blades is controlling the organization behind the scenes. The Toad Sage's mind immediately went to the three blades that were present in the back. The first one was just standing in place, still like a pillar while observing the classroom through his mask. Although he was standing there, and Jiraiya could see him, his presence was fleeting, almost as non-existent as that of Ken himself. It was hard for Jiraiya to tell what was on his mind. The second blade looked a lot more casual. He seemed to be sipping on some tea, he had seemingly made a small hole in his mask for that specific purpose. He was sat down on one of the seats in the back, his figure smaller than that of the first, less eye-catching, but certainly still intimidating to Jiraiya. Although his presence seemed more pronounced, he also gave the Toad Sage a creepy feeling. The type that made one thing clear I don't want to get involved with this one. The third blade was the most confusing, however. He was also sat down, his legs resting on the desk in front of him, as his arms were crossed and had tilted backwards. He seemed to be snoring. Hm I guess the one behind the brainwashing would either be the first or the second or maybe the third is actually secretly a genius as well. It's really hard to tell. As Jureya continued musing and trying to get a better read of the situation, the lesson also started. Last time, we talked a bit about the theory behind nature energy, what it is, how it functions and the effects it may have. The blind monster's voice was quiet and imposing, it demanded attention, and Jureya was immediately broken out of his trance, as his eyes settled on the lecturing teacher. I'm sure that many of you have already tried it, right? To get a feel of the nature energy around you, to try and sense it. Although the lesson was directed towards the children, Jiraiya still couldn't help but pay attention. He had already agreed to attend the lessons, so he was going to at least try and make the most of them. Yep YEP teacher's description of this nature energy was really cool. The blood of the world itself there's no way we wouldn't at least try to sense it. You clapped her hands, happily responding to her master teacher. Many of the children present nodded at her words, Tatsukio and Morita included. Ken had been quite blunt during their past lecture. He made it very clear that nature energy was far superior to chakra in terms of the raw power it provided its users. Although it was a completely different type of energy from chakra, and it couldn't quite be molded the same way chakra could be, it was still similar in many ways. And when it came to raw power, there really was no comparing the two of them. Many of the children had already tried to get a feel of it, all of them sitting down and meditating in their spare time. But none of you have made any progress, right? Ken crossed his arms and tilted his head. 
All the children were quiet this time round, looking down in disappointment all but one. I can feel it, father you have big energy around you. Bigger than everyone else. A little girl with her hand raised was the one to speak out. Her speech was a bit messy and her words a bit frantic. It was none other than Yumebi, Tiyum, the dark brotherhood's youngest. She gestured with her hands as she spoke, raising them to the sky as she described the literal pillar of nature energy that was Ken's body. Now, if Ken had eyes, he would have been blinking in confusion at that. He hadn't expected any of the children to sense nature energy in such a short time frame. Yuri's eyes almost popped out of his head as well. He looked at the young girl with shock and awe. Sensing nature energy was no small feat. Countless others struggled for days on end to sense it when starting their sage training, and that was within the confines of Mount Mamboku. They were all training near the spring, where the density of nature energy was the greatest in the world. Only I knew that there were plenty of talents around in the Dark Brotherhood, but I didn't think there would be this many geniuses around. The one-legged devil and bloody princess were bad enough already. But it seemed that the Dark Brotherhood had caught a lot of golden eggs among their recruits. Jiraiya couldn't help but feel slight jealousy. That is interesting. In that case, you can come and stand beside me. Ken seemed to have wanted to say something more, but he ended up just shaking his head and smiling underneath his mask. Yum seemed a bit surprised. But she didn't object. Her small figure walked up to the podium, and she stood straight by her teacher's side. Ken didn't miss one moment as he gave her a hearty laugh and patted her head. Congratulations Yum. It seems you do have a knack for this. The assassin didn't hold back on the praises, gladly stopping his lecture for a few moments to put a smile on the little girl's face. Now, this action did stir a lot of jealousy within the other recruits present, more specifically you, but that was a story for another day. The recruits didn't get the time to be jealous for too long, as Ken's mass face turned back towards the classroom. Now, although Yum has managed to sense nature energy on her own, I will still help all of you to sense it here today. At the same time, I will also make sure that you are truly prepared to learn Sinjutsu Ken then grasped at the back of his head, and cracked his neck. He let out a loud exhale. The entire room was excited, wondering how their teacher would help them. Jirei was also scratching his chin, studying the blind monster, trying to guess what he was going to end up doing. And that was when it happened. Ken raised one of his arms towards the classroom, his palm hung limply as his fingers all pointed towards the ground. And the moment that the blind monster's fingers pointed up, all the people in the classroom felt it. They were unable to ignore it, anyone who had their eyes open could see it. A purplish aura extending from Ken's palm, a malevolent wave of energy pushed everyone back, all of the students covering their heads, and taking a few steps back before kneeling down to withstand the pressure. The second the wave appeared, Jiraiya was already stuck to the wall at the very back of the classroom, he stuck to it like a frog, as he watched the podium with terror in his eyes. He had jumped from his seat and onto that wall the moment Ken's fingers had pointed upwards. He sweated heavily as he realized that the nature energy Ken was exuding just felt wrong. It was almost perverted in a sense, it was no longer pure. Yu gasped in excitement, her hair fluttering in the wind as she stabbed her needle blade into the ground to hold on. Tsukio seemed to be able to stop himself by sticking to the floor with chakra, but he was leaning backwards while in a protective position. Morita was down on all fours, sticking to the floor with all of his strength, as his cheeks fluttered under that pressure. Many of the students were using similar methods to not be pushed back too much. Meanwhile, Yuma Ken's side also took a small step back, but she wasn't really feeling any pressure. It was obvious, the lesson wasn't for her anymore. Ken was going to force the students to get accustomed to nature energy the hard way. Even if it was an impure form, such brutal pressure would definitely open up their senses to nature's energy. She ended up smiling in amazement as she stood by her teacher's side, and watched her classmates struggle. Can you have until the end of the class to pass by me and stand by my side? If you fail to do so, then you will return to your regular scheduled training. You may get the chance to return to Sinjutsu training in the future, but you will be added to another batch after becoming stronger. Ken's words were like a bucket of cold water amidst a heat wave. Everyone was already stressed out due to the pressure, but hearing Ken's voice calmed them down greatly. And it also motivated them. They couldn't lose it. They couldn't lose the chance to be taught by Ken personally. Marita gritted his teeth as he forced himself to crawl forward, he was the first among the students to take a step. Before anyone could even blink, a slight gust of wind passed through the classroom, and the first blade was already standing by Ken's side, his arms held behind his back as he stood there silently. Jiraiya's eyes widened once more when he noticed that. Not only at the fact that someone was able to withstand Ken's pressure so quickly, but also because of his speed. Haha Lao Yuan was hurt next, as the third blade was seemingly woken up from his nap. He looked around confused for a moment before shrugging and walking forward like nothing was happening. He seemed to also not be in any rush. He just kept his hands behind his head as he yawned and walked through the pressure, he eventually reached the podium without any issue, and just sat down by Ken's side. Seems like someone's been fed well, the second blade slowly put his teacup down as he also stood up, he then vanished from his spot and reappeared behind Ken as well. 
He seemed to have just used the body flicker technique. Holy shit this place really is filled with monsters Jureya couldn't help but sweat. He wasn't sure if the exercise applied to him as well. But he damn well didn't want to appear any weaker than the blades. So he immediately started running towards the podium as well. His speed was good, certainly not any lesser than that of the first blade. And he made it through the aura wave as he overcame his fear of it. He was a legendary Sanin for God's sake, he wasn't going to allow himself to be outdone by some masked wackos in a bounty hunting organization. In the end, the children also bore through the pressure. Their eyes were resolute, their minds fearless. After all, why would they ever fear their father? The trust they placed in him was greater than anything. So there was no need for any of them to worry about getting injured. So they just trudged ahead. Morita was first to reach the podium, crawling onto it and lying down while panting with a smile on his face. The next to reach it was Tsukio, he simply dashed towards it, flying through the air in a few straight angles before landing behind his teacher in a crouched position, well, he was mainly supporting himself on his arms as his one leg was crouched down. After that, it was Yu's turn to show off her skills. She immediately used her sewing needle to extend a dozen or so threads onto the stage, and she pulled herself towards it using them. She did try to accidentally crash into her teacher, but Tasha fortunately caught her by the scruff of her neck, and dragged her way to a corner of the podium, where he placed her down like one would a puppy. After that, the rest of the students also managed to cross onto the podium, although at a slower pace than their more talented classmates. However, in all fairness, many of them were situated more to the back of the class, which also made things more difficult for them. Overall, Ken was very pleased with the results of the test. Many of the children seemed now to be more aware of the nature energy around them. All of them could now, at the very least, sense Ken's aura, even when he was not bothering to use it actively. Of course, this was as long as Ken wasn't bothering to hide it. Still, that was very good progress in itself. As for Yume. Well, she had just managed to become Ken's third personal disciple within the Brotherhood. Ken was going to be giving the little girl a lot of extra lessons, to allow for her overwhelming talent to bloom and shine thoroughly. Hmm, yes. Things seemed to be going quite well Ken couldn't help but smile as he finally reached his office after a long day. He sat down, and the second he did so Tasha was already entering his room, with a letter in his right hand. Master, it seems that we've received a request for help from a rather large group of orphans within the land of rain more work, huh? The assassin just sighed as he slumped into his chair. POV narration. Well, calling them a group of orphans may be a bit harsh. But they do all seem to be teenagers, 15 and above. Tasha spoke out as he stood in place and waited for his master's orders. Ken just sighed and shook his head. Still the Akatsuki, huh? Ken rested his legs on the desk in front of him, as his mind started struggling to remember whether or not he had heard of them before. But no matter how much he struggled, he couldn't quite remember any mention of such a group in the past few years, that he had been active in that area. There are seemingly a new organization, founded on the coattails of the Second Shinobi War, well, near the start of the Third Shinobi War in fact. Tasho had seemingly already done his homework. Having received that message right after the lecture and rushing to find out more about the Akatsuki as a group. It hadn't even taken him a full hour to reach out to his various informants, and find out more about the situation in the Land of Rain. The Akatsuki were essentially an insurgent group that sought to end the warring period. At least that was their stated mission to the world. They were indeed mainly comprised of war orphans, so it was fair to say that their goal was likely genuine. But that was about where Tasho's knowledge of them started and ended. It wasn't like he had time for a thorough investigation for a random help request. But since he knew of Ken's stance regarding the war, he felt that it was worth bringing up the Akatsuki's request to him, since their views seemed to align to some extent. The blind monster listened to his right-hand man's short report. So what does their message even contain anyway? You described it as a request for help. Ken's intent was clearly portrayed through his words, at least for Tasho, who knew his master best. Although he was acting indifferent, Ken's interest was certainly piqued. After all, it was quite rare for a group of shinobi to be vying for the end of the war. Then there was also the fact that both the Dark Brotherhood and the Akatsuki seemed to be a place of refuge for orphans of war. Those two factors alone were more than enough to capture the blind assassin's attention. Well, they're specifically asking for an audience with you. They seem to have learned that you aren't that far from their age, and that you don't get involved too often in the wars of the shinobi, so they're looking for a helping hand with ending the war, huh? Ken tilted his head as he continued his subordinate's words without stopping for even a second. It was the only logical reason as to why the Akatsuki would contact the Dark Brotherhood. Although Ken hadn't expressed his will to bring about peace to the world yet, the Brotherhood was already notorious for staying out of the Shinobi Wars. Ken personally did get involved in one conflict related to the war, and did clash with the Mizukage and killed the Jinchuriki. But that was said to be a mission for a friend, the Reikage. And having the Reikage as a friend likely just meant that Ken had more influence in the world for the young leaders of the Akatsuki. Well, that is the gist of what I gathered from their message. So what is the plan, will you be visiting them? 
Tasho nodded and crossed his arms. The Samahada behind him also wiggled a bit, awaiting Ken's response with entry. It's worth looking into at the very least, but I am afraid that the children may become a bit overzealous. Ken seemed to be a bit conflicted, causing Tasho to tilt his head slightly. And then why might that be? Tasho crossed his arms and waited for his master's answer. The blind assassin didn't let him wait for long. I did just help them all become more sensitive to nature energy. I'm afraid they may start trying to absorb it on their own and without any supervision. Ken Sai weighed heavily in the room for a few seconds. Tasho seemed to be thinking for a few seconds before he turned and looked at Ken. Well, they're much more well behaved than that they won't attempt something you specifically prohibit them from doing. They all listen to you and respect you. He was quick to come up with some sort of reassurance, but it didn't seem to be enough for Ken. Oh, I don't doubt that for one second. But they are also extremely eager to prove themselves. They all want my recognition at the end of the day. And just about all of them tried to sense it before that lesson even started. Well I am here, I can sense them at all times, so I can make sure they don't try something stupid. Don't get me wrong, I trust you fully, but your eyes aren't as good as mine. Ken's speech came to an end on a rather sad note. But Tasho didn't seem at all discouraged. He was well aware that he couldn't possibly keep his eye on everyone in the compound like Ken could. He did think he managed with the 10 children that were taught, but he was still not 100% confident. One thing he learned from working with Ken is that he only really appreciated certainties, and he disliked lies. At least when he wasn't the one telling said lies. That hypocrisy was one of the few things that reminded Tasho that his master was still human, no matter how much his body morphed and changed throughout the years. That and the affection he showed to those he cared for. I apologize for my inadequacies at that point, Tasho could only really apologize. He was supposed to be the second in command, but Ken really was the one that glued everything together. With him there, anything in the world could go wrong, and they'd still find a way to fix it. Without him, things became a lot more difficult. He was a bit disappointed in himself. After all, his master was clearly intrigued enough about the Akatsuki to want to make a trip there, but he was held back by his incompetence. And then he finally got an idea. Well, it is possible that you can go out. For one, you can have Saburo pay special attention to those children, we can hit them with that stick you retrieved from Mount Maiboku, if they really do try something. Tasho immediately started going through a few scenarios, trying to think of the worst possible outcome, if Ken did leave for a week or two. The blind assassin himself decided to just silently listen for now. He didn't need to mention that even with Saburo, there was a chance that one of the children could sneak in some extracurricular lessons, and turn themselves into statues. Tasho was already well aware of that fact. But it was another train of thought that gave the first blade some further reassurance. The more I think about it, the less of an issue I think this becomes. Lord Ken, you did already mention once that you are alive even if you are turned into a statue, correct? Ken nodded at the first blade's question. That is correct. But it's unlikely the same rules will apply to the children, or you for that matter. All of the toad statues within Mount Maiboku were dead yes, but the toad statues were there for years, decades, maybe even centuries. There's no way that a human could live for that long, while unable to feed themselves or drink water. Tasha responded in a rather passionate fashion as the puzzle he was piecing in his head also started becoming clear for Ken. Um, so you're thinking that it's possible for someone that turns into a statue to survive. Ken started scratching his chin for a bit, also thinking of that possibility. In truth, it did cross his head previously, but he really had no precedent for it. He had no way of making sure. On one hand, he was the furthest thing from normal, so he couldn't use himself as a reference. What Ken didn't want was to test things out on his pupils. That was what Jureya was for, but outright turning him into a statue and possibly killing him, could technically turn into a conflict with the leaf, so Ken had to refrain from that as well. Well, that's most likely the case. But we can't be so sure at least not until you test it out. I know finding willing test subjects may be hard, but with your ability, do they really need to be willing? I mean, we do have a basement filled with imprisoned criminals, don't we? At that point, Ken just raised his head, scratched his chin and slowly stood up. I guess they don't have to be willing participants anyway, I'll just test out a few things on them before going thank you for opening my eyes Tasho. I was too fixated on this Ken then immediately walked towards the basement. As he did so, the meeting within the war room was still very much ongoing. The shadowy figure that appeared in the middle of the room, had already calmed everyone down, and they were all back to being seated in their respective spots. So, the plan is that simple, huh? Danzo muttered under his breath as he rubbed his chin with mild interest. Together, the people in that room could rise up a force of around 3,000 elite shinobi, around 6,000 shinobi in total, if they also decided to send out some cannon fodder. The plan was very simple. Hammer the nail that sticks out. An all-out assault on the Dark Brotherhood compound. Now, for someone who reportedly killed a Jinchuriki in one move, 3,000 was nowhere near enough. But as long as they got some heavy hitters, then they would be fine, at least they'd be able to keep Ken busy while getting rid of his associates. Of course, that was what the people in the room thought. 
But the one leading them, the man with the odd eyes and long spiky hair, had other plans. The plan is indeed that simple. I know what most of you are thinking. An all-out assault in foreign territory is never a smart way to go about things, this is why I have already sent some scouts there. They will find the best opportunity for the attack during the following weeks. Your only task right now is to gather your men and wait for my signal when you receive it, advance immediately. The man's deep voice echoed throughout the room. The man's transparent figure shook slightly, causing the man to close his eyes for a second. It seems that this meeting will have to be cut short. Wait for my signal, we will strike at the most opportune time, and just like that, the heavy atmosphere in the room was lifted. All of the people present looked at one another, all of them narrowing their eyes through their masks. It seems we all have some preparations to make as much as I don't like working with these people, the red dot is too big a potential threat to be ignored, and just like that, the stage was set. And the man that had pulled the strings, the one who possessed the strange eyes, was currently in a completely different corner of the world. A weak old man, his back bent by the weight of time, his hair bleached white due to age. His wrinkled face sweated a bit as he swayed to the side unsteadily. In that instant, another figure rushed towards him, catching him in an instant. A pale-skinned figure with green hair. It just silently held steady the old man. At that moment, the old man's eyes transformed from their ring pattern to a simple three tomo shuringen pattern. The old man panted. Keeping up that illusion sure is tough, he sighed as his companion also laughed a bit. Maybe it would have been easier if you kept your eyes you wouldn't have had to fake them at least. The pale humanoid figure spoke out, slightly chastising the old man, while also keeping his tone respectful. HMPH, I don't expect you of all people to understand my vision. This is necessary, my plans must be seen through to the end. That red dot and his little ragtag group of orphans, are nothing more than a momentary nuisance. The old man laughed a bit as he allowed himself to be carried over to a bed. Of course sir, the pale humanoid spoke out as he helped the old man lay on that bed. At that moment, a fleshy tentacle extended from the shadows and connected itself to the old man's abdomen. HMPH, we'll see if he is truly worthy enough to be compared to Hashirama POV narration. Setsu, a being spawned out of a mix of impure nature energy, drained from the Jido statue, the husk of the old ten tails, and Hashirama cells. An entity that couldn't possibly be described as human, but had a humanoid shape. His pale white skin also stood out, moss-like green hair making him even more recognizable, but Setsu wasn't just one entity. No, the Zetsu were already in the hundreds, creations of the great Madari Chiha from when he was still playing around with his Rinnegan and his dead friend's DNA. Now, the Rinnegan, the Eye of the Sage of Six Paths, was no longer in his possession. His plan was already in motion. The Eye of the Moon plan. The one way to truly achieve world peace in the eyes of the Chiha ancestor. But why didn't the stone tablets ever mention anything about someone like Ken? The Chiha stone tablets were what guided Madara's vision, even as his eyes were growing dim with age, and the light in his eyes slowly faded away, he still could see them clearly, burned into his memory. The truth of the Chiha, the Rinnegan, the power he needed in order to achieve his ultimate goal of world peace. The tablet spoke of a prophecy, a prophecy that he was going to be the one to fulfill. A way to permanently break the cycle of hatred and give the world what it so badly needed peace. But that was still a long way off. Madara was still slowly putting all of the pieces on the table when Ken appeared. The Red Dot. A person who could only be described as overwhelmingly powerful, and due to his age, ultimately a danger to Madara's plans. It was impossible to fully convey the frustration that Madara felt when he saw how the destruction of the Yuzumaki had failed. It was a rather important part of his plan, as the Yuzumaki were always a pesky adversary with their sealing techniques, more specifically their bloodline limit was what made Madara want them gone. The adamantite sealing chains, a technique so powerful that it allowed even a weak member of the Yuzumaki to hold down even the most powerful tailed beast, the Nine Tails. Of course, it was thankfully not as common as the Shuringen was for the Ichiha, otherwise, the Yuzumaki likely would have already taken over the world as a technique, it was simply absurd, which was why Madara wanted them gone for assurance that his plan had no chance of failing. Of course, his involvement in that matter was rather minimal, as the Shinobi villages had their own reasons for wanting the Yuzumaki dead. But now it had all gone down the drain. And Madara knew, even if he had no actual proof, that it was all the work of Ken. Too many coincidences aligned perfectly for it to be anyone else. Of course, Madara knew that even if he was to try and pin it on Ken, to attempt to make more villages go after him, he wouldn't succeed. The only villages left that were not part of the war room were a few smaller ones, the Cloud and the Mist Village. The smaller villages couldn't matter less than Madara's eyes. There were nothing but cannon fodder in front of someone like the Red Dot. The Mizukich was genuinely terrified by Ken. To the point where he simply preferred not to get involved in the matter at all. Ken had also seemingly burrowed into the mind of the Rakage, to the point where Madara couldn't even come close to making him see the light. No matter how many anonymous messages he sent, the Rakage didn't take any one of them seriously. To him, the matter of his son's death was already over. They had found the culprits, and they had also found actual physical evidence of the crime. 
At that point, any attempt to link Ken to that crime would be seen as a ploy in the Rekiju's eyes. At that point, Nadara couldn't help but marvel at the mind that had thought out that plan. He was unsure if the Red Dot had acted alone, or if there was someone within the Brotherhood that was influencing their moves. But whoever had thought up that plan was surely going to prove troublesome in the future. So, it was decided. We need to get rid of the entirety of the Dark Brotherhood, just to make sure no one will stand in our way. Nadara already ordered one of the Zetsu to spy on the Brotherhood. They were very difficult to detect, after all, no sensor could find them at all, as they didn't even have a chakra network. Unfortunately for Madar, his intel was not quite as exact as he would have liked it. He had no idea that Ken was not only a sage, but also technically always in sage mode. The second the white Zetsu reared its head out of the ground a few kilometers away from the Brotherhood, Ken's face immediately turned in its direction, and he tilted his head. That strange doesn't feel human, no smell, no chakra feels more like me actually, but even weirder. For a second, the blind assassin pondered on whether or not to take action against the intruder. But after observing him it for the better part of an hour, Ken realized that it was more than likely a spy. Tasho, at some point, also realized that his master's attention was pointed somewhere. The first blade was, as of late, almost always by Ken's side inside that small office. He could easily tell when Ken got distracted. He had noticed Ken's behavior from the beginning as it had come, while they were looking through some paperwork well, Tasho was looking, and Ken was just nodding to the reports. It didn't take long for the first blade to become curious. Did something happen, master? Or, do we have any visitors that I am unaware of? Ken smiled a bit as he shook his head slightly. I'd say more in line with the second an unannounced visitor seems to be a spy more specifically. Tasho immediately perked up, he tried to sense if anyone was nearby, but he found himself unable to. Don't bother. He seems to be impossible to spot with normal means. You may be able to do it in the future after you master sage mode. Ken shook his head once more as his head turned in that direction once more. Should I go out and apprehend the spy sir? Tasho's tone sounded as serious as could be. After all, the spy had managed to sneak past everything, every seal they had placed for protection and detection. It was certainly a matter of concern. Don't bother, he doesn't seem to be particularly strong. It doesn't even appear that our intruder has any chakra, which is likely how he snuck in. At that point, Tasho just scratched his head in confusion. In his mind, there was no such thing as a human, or being for that matter, without a chakra network. It just felt wrong. As still, wouldn't it be better to catch him so we can study him in that case? The million dollar question, there was no doubt in Tasho's mind that Saburo would love to get his grubby hands on such a fine specimen. Bah, we'll get the chance to capture him or it. But it's not worth announcing the ones that sent him of our awareness, it would seem that a group, probably a quite powerful one at that, is planning something that's related to our little organization. At that point, Tasho's grip tightened on the papers he was holding, slightly crumpling them as his anger boiled. They had done their best to avoid offending as many people as possible during their work. Even when Ken handled personal matters, he always made sure to keep outside relations mostly positive with very few exceptions, like the grass and the rock villages. But it seemed that no matter how much effort they put into building their own piece of heaven, the outside world was bound to want to crush it into the ground. Don't get too discouraged. I am 70% sure that this is related to me at the end of the day. But it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. Whether it's now or in two years, it's all the same to me. Ken shook his head and pondered upon a few things. On one hand, it could be argued that revealing his age was what might have brought even more attention to the Brotherhood. But at the same time, he had already proven that he was a threat by breaking the Mizukage and killing the Jinchuriki of the Waterfall. It was only a matter of time before someone deemed him too much of a threat to keep around. The blind assassin didn't really have any idea of the forces on the other side. Whatever informants the Brotherhood had failed to notice anything off as of late. In the end, they were being dragged into a war. And they were being dragged into a war while blind. Tasha must have also realized that, as Ken could feel his emotions growing more somber every second. But at the same time, there was something both Ken and Tasha realized. Something that put the First Blade's worries at bay at least momentarily. The Dark Brotherhood can fight without sight our opponents, whoever they may be, better be prepared Tasha, if you will, can you call the other blades here as well. Ken scratched his chin as he waved his first blade off. Tasho slowly nodded before getting up, then he seemed to tilt his head slightly as a sigh of frustration left his lips. I just remembered something. Saburo mentioned that he had to go out for a bit, he moved his main body to somewhere a bit further away, to keep contact with the clones, so he wouldn't be able to personally make it here. The first blade sounded a bit frustrated, both by the situation and the second blade's absence. Well, his clones are still around the compound, so he can still attend, even if he isn't here physically, but why was he going out again? Ken shrugged off the first part, but immediately became curious at the second. He didn't go into details. He just said he'd go out to meet with an old associate, that answer immediately felt off to the blind assassin. An old associate, huh? 
At that same time in the middle of a forest within the confines of the land of Fang, the dim daylight couldn't even cut through the leaves, as a masked human wearing a long cloak slid down into a small cave and walked forward. The masked human walked in a borderline mechanical manner, akin to a puppet on a string, but otherwise completely normal to the untrained eye. It walked through that cave without ever bothering with seeking a source of light. Three minutes passed before it reached a wall, and that wall only opened when the masked man made a few hand signs and bit his finger, placing it on the rock in front of him. A hidden door slid open, revealing a dimly lit room, with a low table in the middle. Crouched down at that table was a noble-looking man, clothed in the finest of silk, also wearing a fox-like face mask. I am glad that you received my message Stroman Saburo the fox masked man spoke out, addressing the Stroman's clone in front of him. Oh my, if it isn't Lord Yuru. It's certainly been a minute. The clone also addressed the man before casually sitting down in front of him. And so, a meeting between two former allies started. POV narration. What is this about exactly, Yuru? The Stroman's clone took the honorifics out of the picture, deciding to get straight to the point with the current leader of the grass village. There were no amicable feelings in that room, just cold and dead silence. Ha, you haven't changed a bit you seem to have expected that, he clapped his hands and smiled at his former subordinate's mannerisms. Get to the point, you have exactly 60 seconds that I am granting out of courtesy, Saburo spoke out in the exact same manner. HMPH, fine. The grass leader huffed before leaning into the table, interlocking his fingers and resting his chin on them. I want you to help me and my associates with intel to help take down the Dark Brotherhood, your current employer. In exchange, the Grass Village and many other villages would be willing to support your ventures for an extended period of time. Yu smiled deviously as he watched Saburo's clone with great expectation. How much support are we talking about here, and what is that period of time? Saburo responded with the same cold tone, only taking a pause at first to think about the offer for a second. Well, as much support as I was providing you before at the very least, financially speaking, you would also receive a bulk sum from the other parties involved in this, I can arrange that. The period of time we can leave is undetermined, but this all depends on the quality of intel that you can provide us. The clone shifted for a second, bringing a hand up and scratching its chin for a few seconds. In the end, the strawman just sighed and shrugged. Fine, sounds like a good offer now give me more details of the overall situation. I need to know what I'm dealing with if we are to strike any deal. The strawman ended up agreeing with the terms, finding them satisfactory after a few seconds of inward deliberation. However, he didn't agree to the deal itself yet, instead, he immediately requested more information, which Yu didn't seem to be too appreciative of. HMPH, don't worry your head over that. Everything is already planned. You just need to give us your knowledge of the Dark Brotherhood. Are you an idiot or do you take me for one? Tell me what assurance you have to take on the Dark Brotherhood, if not, stop wasting my time with this foolishness. Saburo coldly replied to the Grass Village leader, scoffing in disdain as he spoke. The deal sounded nice on paper, that was great and all. But at the end of the day, it was Yu who needed to convince Saburo to impress him in some way to get him to agree to the deal. Just claiming that he'd get support wasn't going to cut it by the look of things. TSK, fine. Peel your ears properly. The Dark Brotherhood is well and truly doomed meanwhile, inside the Dark Brotherhood compound, things were still ramping up. Tensions were high as Tasho wrapped his head around the implications of Saburo leaving at such a crucial time. What are we going to do, master? That was his first question. Of course, he could think of plenty of ways for them to fight back in their current situation, but Ken's opinion and words were what mattered at the end of the day. In the first place, they had no idea what they were dealing with. And if Saburo had truly decided to cross them, they were at a severe disadvantage. Saburo, as the second blade, knew just about everything when it came to the way that the Dark Brotherhood functioned, from its structure to its actual power, and even the seals that were placed in and around the compound. Hell, he was even well aware of the method of transportation that the Dark Brotherhood was using, the summoning and reverse summoning contracts. He had a lot of knowledge, and it could easily be used against them. Ken was also well aware of that, but he seemed a lot less worried than Tasho. There's no real reason to panic for now. We have no inherent reason to believe Saburo would betray our deal. We only really have speculation and worries. We don't even know if these people who are looking into us are planning something big or just scouting us out of curiosity. Ken slowly scratched his chin as he stood up and started pacing the room. It was true that they only had speculation, and they couldn't possibly draw a proper conclusion from just the appearance of the spy. However, Ken knew that the reveal of his age attracted a lot of bad attention. People who were afraid of his potential and even his current influence. Plenty wanted to get rid of him before he grew even further. Those were expected reactions. It was a safe bet to assume that anyone who looked into him was looking for trouble. After all, it was always best to assume and prepare for the worst in all possible situations. It was something that Ken had made sure to hammer in as one of the Dark Brotherhood's core principles. To always be prepared for the worst of the worst, to make anything else feel like nothing more than a slight breeze. 
one must build the sturdiest of walls, even for what appears to be the smallest breeze. There were many ways to put it, but it was just one of the many ways that Ken made sure no one would start looking down on their opponents out in the field, no matter how much stronger they were. That core principle was also present in Tasho, who was Ken's very first student. This was also why he immediately thought of the worst when Saburo's absence came into question. Still, he has never been trustworthy, and he is always looking out only for himself who's to say he hasn't found a better offer with our current enemies. The blind monster could only smile at that. Tasha was clearly also driven by his dislike and distrust of Saburo. Ken couldn't really blame him, the second blade hardly pretended to be friendly with Tasho, not that pretending would have even helped much. But Ken didn't have that same prejudice against Saburo. You are completely right in all but one aspect, Saburo is very trustworthy. Tasha was visibly confused by his master's words, he could only blurt out. Hey Chakam. At that point, the smile on Ken's face whitened, his sharp teeth shining in the flickering light of the oil lamp on his desk. You see, we treat trust very differently, you and I. You consider trust to be a sign of devotion, of closeness. I mostly agree with that, it is one's usual definition of trust after all however, I see it a bit differently. To me, having trust in someone can also mean having almost absolute certainty that they will do what I think they will, or what I want them to do. The blind assassin continued strolling through the room at a leisurely pace, his voice quiet enough to sound like a whisper in the wind, but just barely loud enough for Tasho to hear it. Understanding flashed into Tasho's eyes, but Ken still continued. Saburo is, as you've outlined, opportunistic. Selfish and incapable of forming human connections. He doesn't care for good, he doesn't care for bad, he doesn't care of either you or me, he only cares about what he wants, his goals and means to achieve them. Ken turned around and placed his hand on one of the walls, he gripped it lightly, his fingers slightly digging into it. The wall glowed slightly, and the wallpaper moved, shifting and flipping around to reveal a large blackboard. On it were countless crude but frighteningly detailed drawings, interconnected, countless threads stretched across that board. Each portrait had listed many attributes, writing so small that Tasho could barely see it with his naked eyes. The first blade could only wonder when exactly had Ken even managed to put such a thing together. The collection of every person of interest for their dark brotherhood, their assets, everything they owned it just felt surreal. Tasho had periods where he didn't always watch over Ken, but he never could have guessed what the blind monster was doing with his free time, where did he get such free time anyway? He was training most of the time. I'm sure you are curious about a few things, but it's been quite some time since I felt the need for sleep. Having that much time in the day makes one much more productive. It was only then that everything clicked for Tasho. Ken always, without exception, spent his nights in his office. He had a room, an official master bedroom within the same building. But it was simply collecting dust. H how long has it been how long has he been awake? Tasho's eyes widened as he came to that question. But Ken didn't let him dwell on it for too long, immediately continuing with his previous speech. I don't trust people easily but my eyes never deceive me. Ken then pointed to Saburo's portrait, there were many traits laid out there. Words that Tasho didn't really know either. It was as if parts of the board were written in different languages. Saburo is without a doubt always going to do what benefits him more. Therefore I made sure to give him all of the benefits and freedom that he requested at all times, with almost no restrictions. Ken smiled as his fingers lightly dragged over the writing underneath Saburo's drawing. As things stand, even if he sometimes seems frustrated and unwilling to do things for me, he would ever do something as stupid as to try his luck elsewhere, there is no other village or faction that would support him to such an extent. And he knows it. Tasho seemed genuinely surprised at the way Ken described the second blade's character. It genuinely felt as if his master had thought of everything, that his eyes truly could see all. But as the one that was originally meant to act as Ken's eyes, he still had trouble seeing it. He understood Ken's point, but he couldn't bring himself to ever place his trust in someone like Saburo. Someone who could turn at the flip of a hat. The pinnacle of inauthenticity. I know that this is hard for you to grasp right now. But in essence, Saburo will never betray us over some empty promises. He knows that his current arrangement is the best it could possibly be. He is smart but also predictable. I've met many of his kind, and I've danced with them plenty of times to know their moves. Ken ended up just shaking his head as he felt that his words weren't quite reaching Tasho. You'll have to take my word for it. But right now we need to focus on the outside threat. Something that Saburo will likely have more information on. You can call the others for now Ken then walked over to another side of the room and pulled on a small scroll from his bookcase. Tasho heard a small click before he looked at the blackboard shifting back into a regular empty wall, showing only a painting or two, empty decor. Ken shook his head as he went back to his desk and sat down, slowly reaching for one of the drawers, and putting his mask back on. It couldn't be helped that Tasho was overwhelmed, it was a lot to take in all at once. Still, Ken also trusted Tasho. And he knew that no matter what, Tasho would trust his words and judgment above all else. The first blade blinked a few times, before nodding and sighing. 
The more years I spend by his side, the more I realize just how much I can still learn from him. I understand in that case. I will go call Akir and Sabiruin. We will proceed as you wish. As he left the room, the first blade couldn't help but wonder does Lord Ken actually trust anyone? POV narration. Ken sat down on his desk with his legs and arms crossed, his mask already on his face as he looked at the people who entered his office. The first one to enter was none other than the first blade, Tasho. Still dressed in his usual outfit mostly covered by that long cloak and wearing his mask. Sam Hada was tied to his back with bandages. The one that followed him was the third blade, Akira, the resident immortal of the Dark Brotherhood. He was dressed much the same as Tasho, the only difference being his mask, which had three lines in the middle, and the fact that he carried a different blade on his back. The Kabikurumchi, the self-regenerating weapon that had once belonged to JKZ Mbiwa, was now in the hands of the third blade, the person that had tormented him during the seven hell trials, and broken his will. Even if it was Ken who delivered the final blow, JKZM had already resigned himself to his fate by the time the blind monster got there. After Kier came in yet another member, dressed in a similar fashion but also wearing a large straw hat that covered its head on all sides. Its mask was simply white. It was one of Sabiro's many clones. Even if the second blade couldn't attend in person, he could still be present and speak through his clone, so all was well. Still, even through his clone, the strawman could feel the tension in the room skyrocketing as soon as he stepped in it. It wasn't that surprising given the circumstances, but the biggest source of that tension was Tasho, the first blade. Ken was just sitting in the same position on his desk, unmoving. Sue what's all this about boss? Akira was the first one to speak up, directly addressing Ken whilst ignoring the tension in the room with great proficiency. It seems that our dark brotherhood has attracted the attention of some rather suspicious characters, someone is currently lurking the premises and looking at us from a safe distance. The blind assassin responded without even missing a beat. Akira merely smiled at that, the immortal went and cracked his neck, while asking a very innocent question. Want me to go cut them up? Natasha was there to discourage him. No, we must proceed with caution. We can't alert our enemy that we are aware of them. The first blade huffed, almost as if he was saying something obvious. He didn't bother to remember that his first reaction upon hearing of the spy, was about the same as that of Akira. Ha, huh, so something big is gonna happen then. Do we know anything about the enemy at all? Akira scratched his chin and leaned on the long blade on his back, his tip scratched the floor slightly, but no one told him off. We do not but we hope that someone will be able to help with that as Ken spoke, he angled his head towards Saburo's clone, which had just been silently watching for a while. HHH nothing really escapes you, does it leader? Saburo's voice echoed in the office as he heaved a tired sigh. At the same time, back in that hidden location, Lord Yu had just finished explaining the situation to the Stroman. So a gathering of hidden villages and organizations all striving to take down a future threat to their influence. All led by a mysterious figure that you cannot identify. Saburo repeated that briefly as his usually called voice sounded thoughtful. He with the amount of power gathered, there is no way that the Red Dot or the Brotherhood can ever stand a chance. No matter how strong a dragon is, it can still be killed by an army of ants that's big enough. Yu laughed out loud as he imagined the figure of the bloody and beaten Ken on that battlefield. The grass village may have failed in the past, but with the powers they had now, it was simply impossible. Hell, even the god of shinobi would have had trouble dealing with that many shinobi. And the best of all. We also have the element of surprise. And with your help, everything is bound to go smoothly after all, I am assuming that you are the brains behind the Dark Brotherhood's operations. Yu smiled behind his mask as he spoke confidently, especially on that last sentence. His confidence managed to somewhat confuse Sabiro. Hmm. And what gave you that idea? The strawman muttered under his breath. Oh please. As if some 13 year old kid would be able to come this far in our world, you sure snatched up a nice seedling and developed it nicely too. But you were reaching too far I'm afraid. If you refuse this deal today, then I'm afraid you will be crushed alongside the Brotherhood unless you run away, of course. Yu spoke out with disdain, although, it was to be noted that he added that last part half-heartedly. It seemed that he was confident that Saburo would take his deal. Hmm, you're right it's been a nice experiment, but a smart man knows when to switch sides, I attracted too much attention. Saburo didn't bother correcting the grass village elder, he didn't care enough to do so. Still, in his mind, he couldn't help but curse. Control him. You're right maybe in my dreams. Even if I integrated myself within the brotherhood I am still nothing more than a tool to that blind monster. If only he were as immature as his age suggested well, at least he makes for a reliable business partner, one that I would rather not lose any time soon. Hahaha. <laughs> I knew it. You've always been a sly fox. You laughed out loud, even slapping his knee. His entire demeanor just fell fake, as he had been acting all cold just earlier, but it seemed that having Saburo confirm one of his theories put him in a good mood. The strawman pondered, he seemed to be deeply thinking about the proposal. This made Yu smile, and then he decided to put one last nail in the coffin, something that he believed would help seal the deal nicely. 
Besides rumor in the shinobi world is that the red dot is quite upright, isn't that true? You may be manipulating him into accepting your inhumane experiments for now, but can you be sure that you'll be able to do so in the future? Yu grinned behind his mask, knowing that he had likely hit his soft spot. And in a sense, he certainly raised an interesting issue for Sabiru. Even if he hadn't manipulated Ken into helping with his experiments initially, would the blind monster always be willing to support his experiments? It was indeed true that he seemed to be developing more of a moral compass as the years went by. But this was the first time that Saburo seriously considered the possibility of Ken wanting to alter their deal. Silence stretched in the room as Saburo now seriously considered that possibility as well. The silence didn't seem to be something that you liked by any means. He coughed awkwardly a few times as he awaited the Stroman's response. Very well I accept your terms. Let's talk more about the plan of action back in Ken's office. Saburo smiled as he finished telling Ken and the other blades more about the forces that they were up against. This doesn't sound too good Tasho scratched his chin. Things certainly sounded bleak. But there were plenty of silver linings for one. The attacking villages no longer had the element of surprise. That factor was flipped on its head. Thanks to Yu's stupidity and Saburo's loyalty. They also had a lot more power than the other side knew. Ken himself was growing stronger with each passing day, and the children of the Brotherhood were nothing to scoff at either. And finally, Saburo's actions gave the Dark Brotherhood a rather special opportunity. In this case, we can help our enemies plan a spectacular attack, can't we? Ken smiled widely underneath his mask, as his thoughts eventually wound up to that conclusion. Saburo himself couldn't help but smile. Spectacular indeed. After all, who is better than us when it comes to planning an attack on the Dark Brotherhood? Saburo spoke out, spreading out his arms in a theatrical manner. The cure laughed a bit. Oh boy, this is going to be fun. The mad immortal grabbed onto the hilt of his large blade as he pointed it to the ceiling. Behave, Akira but this is certainly looking possible. With some luck and careful planning, our dark brotherhood might just survive this tribulation. Tasha wasted no time in berating the third blade for almost stabbing the ceiling before he crossed his arms and spoke out in a calm tone. The tension in the room had lessened greatly, and now, everyone was focusing on one thing how shall we proceed. They had plenty of opportunities and a lot of possibilities. Saburo could suggest any plan to Yu, and the grass village leader was sure to pass it along like an obedient puppy. Yu surely believed that he had gained an asset that assured the destruction of the Dark Brotherhood. And he surely was going to try and arrange a meeting with the War Room again, and announce his progress. It wasn't long before the upper echelon of the Dark Brotherhood came up with a proper plan of attack unfortunately. It seems that we will have to postpone Sinjutsu training for now, but it's time to get the show started POV narration. Jiraiya sat down in a meditative position in the middle of the clearing. He sat on a large rock somewhat close to the hallowed out trunk of the tree he had decided to rest in. He tried his best to sense the nature energy around him, he wasn't trying to draw it into him, but to control it. He was failing miserably, as nurture energy, much like Charka, was almost impossible to control well outside of the body. A regular sage could infuse their attacks in Jutsu with nature energy, but they couldn't actually manipulate the nature energy outside of their body. Ken seemed to be the only exception to that rule, and now Jurei was also doing his best to break out of the mold in some way. But he was unfortunately banging his head on a wall by trying to replicate his barely human Sinjutsu coach. In the first place, it was awfully arrogant of him to even bother trying. He wasn't even considered a perfect sage by the standards of the toads yet. It would take a miracle for him to be able to replicate even a small percentage of Ken's mastery and control. It was never a fair contest anyway, Ken had been manipulating nature energy all of his life, constantly. Almost 14 years of constant nature energy manipulation. They were living in different worlds entirely. Maybe I'll be able to do it in the future who knows, as long as I keep studying under him, everything might just work out the sand and had a long road ahead of him. Unfortunately, it wasn't going to be a straight road, but for now, the fledgling sage could feel progress right up ahead. And all of a sudden, he no longer felt like stopping. Instead of just observing the energy around him, he started drawing it in. His mind entered a zone, one in which his focus was entirely directed to that nature energy. And slowly, he gathered it, but practiced ease, he felt his body slightly shifting, growing stronger as it absorbed that energy. He had finally done it. The first time in his life that he had reached that state unaided by others. In the past, he had a lot of issues attracting the nature energy, but now it all seemed to flow naturally. It was the first time in his life that Jureyu felt that powerful, it was a feeling so strong that it could get someone drunk. Excitement overtook him for one moment, and it all came crashing down. He felt the energy within his body go wild and like many times before, the nature energy from all around him rushed into his body, just like before, uncontrollably. Even though he wasn't using any toad oil, the nature energy from around him seemed to be attracted by the energy in his body too much, far too much for him to control. But if he moved and broke his concentration, then the balance would shift, and he'd surely become a statue worse part. There was no one there to help him. 
In those few seconds that he struggled, Jiraiya couldn't help but curse at his own stupidity. Mon Pa had warned him endlessly that he was to not practice on his own, that he was not yet prepared. In that instant, just as he felt his body transforming and gaining frog-like features, a large hand grabbed his head and gripped tight, taking away his breath instantly. The Sanin opened his eyes in shock, he looked at the figure in front of him through the gaps between his fingers. A tall man with an arm that was bludging with muscles, covered in scales, a palm that was as large as half of the Sanin's head, fingers wrapped around his head. It was obviously Kenner the Red Dot, the child that just so happened to be his current teacher in Senjutsu. Just as quickly, Jiraiya could feel the nature energy within him get snatched away unceremoniously. He felt that large hand let go and immediately rolled backwards a few times, taking a few deep breaths and clutching at his chest for a few seconds. I'd appreciate it if you don't try to kill yourself in the future, you're not yet ready to enter sage mode by yourself, especially not in this area. His teacher's voice sounded out in that small patch of force. T thanks. But what's wrong with this place? I've never been able to attract that much nature energy by myself before Jurei muttered as he tried to get a better grasp of the situation and his surroundings. This place and all areas surrounding it are marred. The nature energy is very different from the one on Mount Mayaboku or other areas. It's due to it being filtered through me for a long period of time. It's easy to attract and hard to control for others that aren't me, or at least that seems to be the case. You're lucky I always pay attention to my surroundings and that I rarely sleep. Ken shook his transformed arm, and it turned back into the arm of a human without much issue. The blind assassin then cracked his neck inside, allowing the Sanin to take in his previous words. I guess I should have expected something like this to happen, nothing about you or around you will ever be normal, I guess. Jureya laughed a bit as he slowly stood up, finally regaining his bearings. In his mind, he was also considering the blind assassin's last sentence. He rarely sleeps, huh? Is that why he's that much more mature than someone his age should be? Even then it's pretty odd to consider sleep is rather essential for a human to function properly. Although the world they lived in had yet to study the medical benefits of healthy sleep, they still had some basic understanding of the concept. Well, their understanding came from a rather obvious place namely, sleep deprivation was oftentimes used as a tool to torture prisoners to help get information out of them. Yuria had seen it with his own two eyes, how someone who hadn't slept in around seven days. The man was already showing signs of going crazy. So he had a good example of how lack of sleep could look in someone. But no one had bothered to look into the benefits of getting enough sleep. The Sanin's thoughts wandered for a second or two, as he blinked and wobbled a bit, slightly dizzy from the sudden lack of strength in his body. He had just experienced the strength one would have as a perfect sage after all. But it was stripped away in an instant when Ken touched him, leaving him feeling feeble. Now that we've got that out of the way. Ken clapped his hands, breaking the Sanin out of his mindscape, and bringing him back to the real world. Yes, sorry for going behind your back and trying this. It could have ended real bad Jurei only now realized just how badly he had screwed up. He hadn't just endangered himself, but also Ken's relationship with both the Toads and the Leaf Village. After all, if Jureyu was to die while under Ken's tutelage, it wouldn't end well for the blind assassin at all, and he'd surely get blamed for it. Let's not dwell on it too much but never do that again, summon Ma and Pa at the very least next time. Thankfully for Jureyu, Ken was willing to forgive and forget. Sure thing teach. The Sanin then eyed Ken suspiciously before crouching down. Is something the matter? It seems like something is on your mind, it wasn't hard for the Sanin to notice that Ken had something to say. Even if he hadn't spent that many days near Ken, he was good at reading people. A lot is about to happen within the Brotherhood, and it seems that we will have to postpone our Senjutsu lessons. Ken crossed his arms and also sat down in front of Jiraiya. That's kind of vague. I'm assuming it's an internal affair then. The Sanin sweated a bit as he scratched the back of his head. I guess you could call it that. I have to leave the compound very soon to meet a potential future ally. The blind monster sighed as he spoke, his head turning slightly as he seemed to tilt his head to the side. Ken smiled silently as he felt their little spy arriving on the scene and listening in on their conversation. It's awfully bold of him to come so close to they not know that I am a great sensor. Or, I guess they are just confident in their abilities oh, I get it then. I can stick around in that case, I don't have much to do back in the leaf, things have been strangely silent with the war lately Jureya just shrugged, he wasn't against spending a few weeks in the wilderness. Hell, he could even spend that time with Mon Pa, continuing his training from before. Well, you can certainly do that, but I have a task for you. Ken's hand reached into his coat, and with a sleight of hand, he took out a small scroll. I have a message for Lord Hokage I want you to personally deliver it. Jureya blinked a few times and held out an open palm. Ken placed the scroll there unceremoniously and grabbed the sand and wrist tightly. You seem like a kind man, Jureya, a bit perverted, but kind you can open it. But only when you are halfway through your journey to Kanoha. Those strange instructions made Jureya blink a few times. He was certainly curious, but at the same time, he also realized that he wouldn't get any answers from Ken regarding the scroll's contents. 
So, he just nodded and decided to set out right away. Well, I'm rested enough, I guess I'll go back and see how my little students are doing, and deliver your message of course. Jiraiya grasped the scroll and slipped it into his sleeve, as Ken let go of his wrist and backed away. Jiraiya then rolled his shoulder and turned around, heading for Kanoha right away. Of course, we shall meet again after a while. Who knows, I may come to you myself. Safe travels, Jiraiya. Ken gave the San in one last smile and waved at his back. Same to you, Ken the San in turned around and waved as well with a large and toothy smile on his face. After that, the fledgling sage took off like the wind, using the body flicker technique. At that point, Ken simply cracked his neck one last time, and also took off into the forest, away from the brotherhood. A few seconds after that, the white zetsu that was watching also smiled. So he really did take off, huh? I guess our new intel provider is the real deal, that grass village nobody sure is pulling his weight, better report this back to Madar. The humanoid creature gave one last smile towards the direction that Ken had left, before slipping into the ground. He. He's sure to receive a warm welcome when he comes back POV narration. The sky cried with drops of rain. The ground was barren and cracked, and the entire world seemed to have gained a gloomy atmosphere, as soon as Ken stepped onto the land of rain. The blind assassin felt the rain hit his hair, he felt the droplets reverberating as they hit his mask. It was a rhythmic song, one that he had already gotten used to. Ken had always disliked the rain, as it bothered his sensitive ears at first. But now he was more than used to it. His senses weren't even dulled by it, although it still could help others hide their tracks and scent. But even with that, the droplets of rain couldn't ever wash away the smell that tingled at the blind monster's nose. Blood. Soaked into the earth, not allowed to go dry due to the frequent rain. It wasn't difficult for Ken to realize that he was dashing through a battlefield. He could have gone via air too, his wings gave him that option, but he also didn't want to make his departure from the Dark Brotherhood too conspicuous. Even if it was part of their plan, they couldn't quite make it that obvious for their enemies. After all, Ken had always made an effort to travel stealthily, to attract as little attention as possible. Clouds weren't always going to provide the blind monster with the perfect blanket, and Shinobi always had a keen eyesight. Overall, it was much easier to hide among the vegetation, and he was also a lot more familiar with it. But it seemed that even if he hid well, he was still being tracked that spy. There were dozens just like him stationed throughout the forest as I traveled. Hiding in the ground, in tree barks, everywhere really. They didn't notice me, at least I don't think so, but they clearly know where I'm going. I guess Saburo did his part well, but they still need some time to gather their troops. The executives of the Dark Brotherhood, namely Ken and the Blades, had speculated that their opponents would make a move right when the blind monster was going to return to the Dark Brotherhood. Still, it was surprising that their enemies had stationed so many spies along the road. I wonder how many of these things there are they still didn't feel human to Ken. They felt about as human as he did, but somehow even less as not one of them even had a chakra network. At least it's doubtful that they are strong. Physically they should be decent, but I doubt any Jonin worth his salt would have trouble against them, even if they had physical strength, it didn't mean much unless they also had more tricks up their sleeve. Ken also had that advantage as a child over the seven swordsmen of the mist. He was physically stronger than most of them, but he hadn't yet gotten accustomed to the way that shinobi fought, and he had almost died because of it. Of course, that wasn't the only time he had almost died in his career. But that was when he had been the most unprepared for it. One thing was for sure physical strength alone won't get you very far. I wonder if they have any other tricks up their sleeve there were many variables at play. For one, what if they could also transform? Ken's transformation awarded him with quite a few things, like his claws and tails. There was also the fact that he could manipulate his size at will. But the thing with his transformation was that it relied on him sealing off his tinketsu, stopping the flow of chakra in his body and limbs, or at least thinning it out considerably. The things following him didn't even have any chakra. Going by what I know, these things should just be statues, we'll have to capture a few of them to study for sure. Now that he was on a mostly open field, Ken realized that the spies knew of his location, but at the same time. That was also good, this way his enemies knew that their intel was correct. Ken was always thorough when traveling, yet at the beginning of his journey, he was very much willing to sit by the fire and eat with travelers. He didn't care if anyone saw him with the exception of his targets. That had only really stopped after the hidden villages started annoying him. Constantly trying to recruit him in Wetnet. It's actually a shocker that it took them this long to act out against me, I guess they were too busy biting at each other's throats. It was a shame that his piece of heaven had to be threatened so often, but it was also inevitable. Whether it was today or tomorrow, the Dark Brotherhood was bound to face adversity. But that was what they had been preparing for anyway, so all was well. But for now, the blind monster was going to forget about the war and plotting. Currently, in his mind, he thought only of his goal within the Land of Rain. Meeting the Akatsuki. It was undeniable that they had caught his interest. He now also had the perfect excuse to interrupt the Senjutsu teachings and meet them. 
They were residing within the land of rain, they were considered an insurgency, fighting to help the people of their land against the injustice of war. Honestly, the more Ken had heard about them, the more he wanted to meet them. Of course, he wasn't expecting them to be completely altruistic or anything of the sort. He had already gotten used to being disappointed by Shinobi, so he didn't set his expectations too high. But they were still higher than usual. Eventually, he reached their camp. An assortment of tents at the bottom of a small ravine, and some caves, also seemed to be dug out. Ken stood at the extremity of the ledge, he was crouched down and observing the rather small group that was resting below. There were only around 20 people from what Ken could feel. All of them seemed to be quite average in strength. Everyone in the Akatsuki seemed to be wearing similar clothes too. To Ken, it felt like a zip-up robe. Most of them were also wearing forehead protectors, signifying that they either were or used to be shinobi. But three of them, whom Ken assumed to be the leaders, were the strongest and most noteworthy. They stood at a small table with some papers on it, underneath a wooden roof. They, alongside everyone in the camp, were around Ken's age. That is to say, teenagers. Two of the ones at that table seemed to be capable enough to be called Jomen. At least that was the vibe that they gave off to the blind swordsman. They were likely going to be stuck at that level for a while without proper guidance. Still, for a boy and a girl in the early stages of life, it was remarkable. The teenage boy was dressed like the rest of the Akatsuki, he seemed to have spiky hair that was raised up to the sky. And the girl seemed to have a flower stuck to the bun that was to the side of her shoulder-length hair. Those were about the most remarkable features they had, at least from Ken's senses. But one of them was somehow even stronger than those two put together. His chakra reminded Ken of the Uzumaki, it was extremely vast. His hairstyle was quite simple as well, his right eye was covered by hair, reminding Ken of how teenagers back in his old world, used to style their hair, in order to appear mysterious or something. But he didn't spend much time dwelling on the hair no, he was focused on something much more catching. The teenager's eyes. I have never felt anything like this before those eyes gave Ken an odd feeling, intimidating even. They seemed to contain powers that he knew nothing about, powers great enough to make him reconsider ever facing the wielder of said eyes. This feels far more powerful than the Sharingan it almost feels unnatural, yet not at the same time. I can't quite put my finger on it. Ken used over that feeling for a few good seconds. And in that time, it seemed that the one wielding those eyes spotted him as well. The blind monster could feel those eyes on him, it was almost as if they were looking at his soul. A good thing he isn't participating in the upcoming war. Ken sighed as he took a step off the edge and immediately plummeted towards the earth, much to the shock of the people below. And just as he was about to hit his landing, the one with special eyes moved his hand, pointing his palm at Ken's airborne body. The blind assassin felt a powerful force pluck him from the air, and towards that open palm. Manipulating gravity. No, is it space. Hard to tell Ken resisted that pull with all of his might, twisting in mid-air and flipping over the special teen, grabbing his extended wrist in the process, and pulling it up as he landed behind him. Most of Ken's upper body was shrouded by the shadow of the wooden roof over their heads obstructing the dim sunlight. Ken's movement seemed to be too fast for the other two teenagers to follow, but as soon as he landed they acted. Almost as if on cue, both of the teenagers that had been idling by the side of the strongest rushed to Ken. The boy held a short blade to his throat, and the girl pointed what felt like a paper kunai at his heart. Let go of Nagato, right now. The boy shouted as he prepared to cut into Ken's neck. Meanwhile, the one with powerful eyes, Nagato, stood still with his wrist still firmly in Ken's grasp. The blind monster could feel cold sweat rolling off of the boy's temple. K Konan, Yuhiko, calm down, put your blades down, he's not an opponent we can fight right now. Nagato still didn't turn around as he addressed his two friends, whom Ken now also knew the names of. Ha, what are you talking about Nagato? Your technique worked on him, that means we have nothing to be afraid of. Yuhiko commented while tightening his grip on the tanto that he held to Ken's neck. At that time, Nagato couldn't help but feel fear. He gulped a bit internally. He could've easily ripped my head off as he passed by me just now. What an outrageous monster his fear was well warranted. No one had ever managed to resist the pull of his technique before. No one up to this day. The worst part was that Nagato could tell that Ken had done that with pure strength, a lot more strength than a human had any right to display. So, Nagato was well aware that a monster was figuratively breathing down his neck while towering over him. Thankfully, however, he managed to calm himself down slightly. The Akatsuki hadn't offended anyone yet. Nothing to the point where they would gain such powerful enemies. He had also managed to catch a glimpse of Ken's mask. And a glimpse was all he needed. He responded to her call for help. Ken seemed to be able to feel Nagato's hand relaxing, so he simply let go of it, and took a step back. Conan and Yuhiko immediately got in between Ken and Nagato. The boy with the special eyes immediately turned around and patted both of them on their shoulders, almost pulling them in an awkward hug, as he gave everyone present a shaky smile. If my eyes do not deceive me, I believe that he is our guest the Red Dot. 
Nagato looked in between his two friends as he broke the news to them. Ken also smirked underneath his mask, as he took a few steps to the side, essentially stepping into the light. Your eyes are keen, young man Nagato was it. The blind monster smiled as he internally vowed to remember that name. Ihiko and Conan seemed to freeze in shock almost immediately. Both of their mouths hung wide open as they realized what they had just done did. We just tried to threaten and kill one of the strongest people alive. Also, it's the same person we are supposed to be begging for support, it was a horrific realization to come to. Nagato couldn't help but laugh awkwardly when seeing their stuck expressions. They may take a few seconds to recover mentally from this, but to answer your question yes, my name is Nagato. So Red Dot, it is a great pleasure to have you here. Although Conan and Yuhiko were stunned lot, Nagato was still there to awkwardly but enthusiastically greet their guests. Oh please, call me Ken. I do not care to hear my nickname in casual conversation. And on that note, the diplomatic talks between the Dark Brotherhood and the Akatsuki started. POV narration. Ken sighed as he sat down at the table of the Akatsuki. Things have calmed down significantly now, Yuhiko had to go and calm the other members of the Akatsuki down too, since they were all rather disturbed by the commotion. They were currently waiting on him to continue their meet and greet. Nagato seemed to be more than welcoming to Ken, though he was still acting a bit awkward. Conan was acting quite guarded from the feel of things. It was also surprising to hear that it wasn't Nagato who was the leader of the Akatsuki, but Yuhiko. It seemed that while Nagato was the strongest, he lacked the most basic qualities of a leader and hated public speaking. Somewhat of an understandable situation to Ken. Nagato was still very much a child, a war orphan at that from what the blind monster understood. It's safe to assume no one in his family awakened the same ocular power. I doubt they would have become victims of war if that was the case. Ken couldn't quite put his finger on how Nagato's power actually worked. He had barely been able to resist the pull, it got stronger the closer he was pulled. He didn't actually resist it in reality, he had only really readjusted his trajectory, and used to pull to jump behind Nagato at that time. He had done so smoothly, but he still almost broke Nagato's wrist by mistake. The power to attract people and objects why haven't I heard of such an ocular power before? Ken's information networks weren't really the best in the world, sure. But he still relied on rather reliable sources. The guild of information brokers he employed gave him updates on the ninja world and on its many clans. But not once did he receive a report about a clan with such a power. It was similar to how he had never received a report about someone with powers like his well, besides the grey fox. But that was also him so it didn't count. It must be some rare bloodline mutation of sorts if that's the case, then it's unlikely that just pulling things is its only ability. The thought was certainly concerning, but it was also very curious. After all, if his pull was so strong as to actually have Ken barely breaking out of it, then how strong were the other abilities? The blind assassin mused for a second before focusing all his attention on the matter at hand. Yahiko seemed to have finally returned, and now all three teenagers seemed to be looking up at him to start the conversation. Hmm, I guess I shouldn't expect teenagers to be accustomed to political talks. Letting me control the conversation in their own territory doesn't give off a good first image. Yahiko seemed to be the most upbeat and would have likely started the conversation had things been different. But he was likely a bit stressed by the fact that he had just held a blade to his guest's neck. Nagato seemed a tad too socially awkward to start up the conversation again, and Conan was still too guarded. Since we are all here, and there are no other distractions, I suggest we start with introductions. And so, Ken crossed his arms and decided to take the helm of the conversation. Alright. Yuhiko seemed to finally recover, coughing into his fist before giving Ken a wide smile. I am Yuhiko, leader of the Akatsuki. To my right here is Nagato, and this here is Conan. Yuhiko reintroduced everyone present, Nagato just smiled and waved, while Conan nodded towards Ken. It seemed she decided to drop her somewhat hostile behavior. At the end of the day, it was the Akatsuki who requested the Dark Brotherhood's assistance. It is a pleasure, my name is Ken, people call me plenty of things these days, but you may just use my name. The blind monster nodded towards the trio before turning his attention to their table, where a parchment was laid out with a kunai stabbed somewhere on it. All three of you are quite skilled did you have any formal training? Ken asked while scratching his chin. Well, we did have a master for a while, Conan gave a short answer while looking away for a second. It was Jiraiya, one of the three Sanin of the Leaf Village, he was our teacher while he fought in the Land of Rain. Nagato didn't seem to have any qualms about telling Ken the truth. Jiraiya. Ha, quite a funny coincidence Ken couldn't help but smile as he remembered the perverted sage. Oh did he also teach you at first? Ihiko seemed excited at the prospect of having the same master as someone of Ken's reputation. Hm. No way. I am his teacher in Senjutsu. Ken's answer was like a bucket of cold water dropped on Yuhiko's head. The trio blinked a few times, not quite sure how to react to the fact that someone a bit younger than them was the teacher of their teacher. Ken didn't seem too interested in continuing that talk, however, so he decided to just jump onto the main point. So what is the reason for calling me? Is it just to establish contact, or something more urgent? 
Ken tilted his head to the side and spoke in an even and monotone voice. The three teenagers looked at each other, and silently nodded to one another, seemingly coming to a silent agreement. W well it's more about gaining your cooperation for our future goals. We don't have much to offer, how we are barely scraping by ourselves right now, Yuhiko sighed in regret as he looked to Ken and spoke out with honesty. His tone was so truthful that it shocked Ken. There was no way that someone as inexperienced as Yuhiko could have faked it, it was impossible to fake. In truth, I don't want the other members to hear this, but we may be in way over our heads here. We want to bring peace to our land of rain, to give it a chance to thrive in peace, but it seems near impossible to do with what we currently have. Yuhiko continued speaking with honesty, even sounding regretful and slightly downtrodden. Well, who could blame him? They sure had a lofty goal for a gathering of teenage war orphans. Yet, they have a noble goal they really are more like him, huh? It immediately reminded the blind monster of Minato. Both Yuhiko and Minato seemed to share those characteristics. Altruism and honesty, both traits that Ken respected deeply. These were the traits that Ken was shown from a young age in that world. Displayed by none other than the samurai who had given their lives to raise him for nothing in return. It was a nice reminder that there were still people like that in the world. That there were more of them than Ken had initially thought, and that they were fighting their own battles. But they were unfortunately such positive traits that could be easily taken advantage of in the world of Shinobi. That's why we need the backing of a force like the Dark Brotherhood. Even if it's in the future, with your help, we may be able to finally allow our land to breathe. To give his people the peace they so badly need and deserve I know I am asking for support while providing little to nothing in return, but please please help us. Yuhiko bowed his head as he spoke out with raw emotion. Ken couldn't help but smile underneath his mask as he felt both Nagato and Conan bow by their friend leader's side. It was a rather heartwarming scene. At that point, Ken had a few options. But in the end, no matter the motives, it all came down to two distinct choices either to help the Akatsuki or not, there were many things to consider for the leader of the Dark Brotherhood at that point. Ken was no longer making decisions just for himself after all. Should the Dark Brotherhood really be getting involved in another nation's struggles at this stage? It was a tricky question. They were about to go to war after all, they needed all the resources they had. But at the same time this war should get rid of most of our enemies, both hidden and not so hidden. After that, we will be able to do as we please. If the Dark Brotherhood could repel such a powerful force, not one of the leaders in the elemental nations would dare to even get close to it with bad intentions in the future. Besides, there was also another rather important point they are asking for immediate support, they just want some help, and to have our backing. Yuhiko and the Akatsuki weren't exactly asking for anything in particular either. Even if Ken just said sure we'll support you. And then left without any further contact they wouldn't even be able to complain. In the first place, Ken had made the mistake of thinking that some type of negotiation was going to happen when he had first arrived. He wanted to treat it as a usual diplomatic discourse. But that wasn't what was happening at all. It was just a heartfelt request for aid from a group of orphans in need. And how could Ken ever face the children in the Dark Brotherhood if he turned down such a request? I don't want to live this life of mine with any regrets, so the answer is obvious. The silence had stretched for a good minute, and during that entire time, the three teenagers in front of Ken hadn't raised their heads. They were clearly growing anxious. They hadn't expected Ken, someone their age, to have such a heavy atmosphere. To them, he seemed even more intimidating than Hanzo the Salamander. They had hoped to be able to speak freely with the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, to approach him on even ground. But it seemed that the rumors about him being a cold and callous man in the body of a teenager, were true to some extent. Or at least that was where their thoughts were going before Ken opened his mouth again. Alright, raise your heads. I'll be honest with you brats. Ken kept his arms crossed as he addressed the three of them with a straightforward tone. The three of them raised their heads finally, all looking at him with a mix of anxiety and hope. The Dark Brotherhood is going to be busy in the following months, we won't have much time to receive your requests for help if they do happen during this time. But we can certainly provide you with the backing you need. Food, clothing, money, we can spare some resources. Ken sighed as he tilted his head to the side, not caring for the rollercoaster of emotions he was putting the three teenagers through, by phrasing his response in such a way. However, they seemed beyond elated when hearing the last part. Gaining the support of the Dark Brotherhood and Ken was about the same as gaining the support of an entire hidden village to them. It was monumental. To the point where Yuhiko and Nagato were even tearing up a bit. Conan seemed to be holding it in, but she was also certainly moved. But Ken didn't even give them time to recover before he reached his hand into his cloak and took out three scrolls. These should contain enough money and food to last you for a while. If you need more feel free to reach out, but again, we will be busy. At that point, the three teenagers all got up with smiles and teary eyes, and started thanking the blind monster, while bowing even more. Thank you. T thank you W we were so worried thank god. All of them seemed to be having different thoughts, but for the most part, all of them felt a deep sense of gratitude. And as a rare occasion for Ken, he didn't plan to exploit that gratitude in any way. 
Instead, he remembered the words of another man that he had grown to respect. From now on, you don't have to be worried anymore. If you are ever in trouble, know that you may find safety in the dark brotherhood's shadow. Just like the daemon of the land of iron had told him once. Certainly a poetic way to look at it, but Ken liked it that way. Yuhiko, Nagato and Conan seemed to like it as well, their eyes shine with happiness as they seemed to be growing more and more excited, likely thinking of how the rest of their members would react to the news of their new sponsor. Now then I should pack up and take my leave now. Here, you can take this. He threw another small scroll on the table. You can use it to summon a bat, her name is Kaya, and she likes carrots. She will be our point of contact from now on. Ken gave the teenagers an okay sign, ignoring the flabbergasted looks they were giving him. Oh okay but are you leaving already? You can stay for a bit more, get to know the others as well, Nagato decided to speak up this time. His nature certainly seemed more timid, but he seemed to want to befriend Ken nonetheless. Unfortunately for him, Ken had other plans. I can't stay for long right now, I have to return to the Brotherhood soon, it has been a pleasure speaking to you all, Ken cracked his neck and waved at the three of them as he turned away. The teenagers seemed a bit overwhelmed by this, and in the end, they only did one last thing. Truly, thank you for everything Ken. They waved at him as he disappeared from their eyes, leaving them just as quickly as he came. In the end, the blind monster had left quite an impression on the youngsters, their meeting was short but memorable for all three of them. And Ken also now had a good impression of the Akatsuki. He hadn't expected to meet such a good bunch. He smiled as dashed away, his mind focusing on the road ahead. Now then I guess it's time to wage war. POV narration. Tasho and Akira both sighed as they looked over the vast expanse of forest and snow in front of them. They sure chose a good season for this stupid attack. I hate the cold. Akira, the third blade, shivered slightly as he sat atop the closed gates of the Dark Brotherhood compound. Standing by his side, Tasho couldn't help but shake his head. The weather wasn't that bad a few weeks ago, but I guess winter does have its way of surprising people at times. The first blade spoke out while observing the forests in front of him with an indifferent gaze. I mean, you think seasons would be more predictable, but I guess lately everything has been unpredictable. It's jarring to see snow falling on green leaves, but aside I've grown accustomed to Tasho's posture, didn't change at all, as he addressed the second blade who sat by his side. He seemed to be both relaxed and wary at the same time. Both of them were wary to some degree, it seemed that they were expecting something. Something big, which could happen at any moment. We do have the advantage of knowing their next moves, Akira said as he slowly stood up, noticing the trees in the distance shaking slightly. Yet they have the numerical advantage, and the power advantage. Tasho seemed to also notice the movements, the Samahata on his back wriggled in happiness. Hmm I don't know about that last part. Our leader is pretty strong. Akira cracked his neck and took out the decapitation carving knife from a seal on his wrist. Well they also have that. Tasho cracked his neck as he looked at a gigantic figure appearing in the distance, toppling all of the trees around it. Both of the blades swayed slightly as they looked at it. A red furred and green skinned gigantic gorilla with four tails. It roared loudly, shaking the forest around it as fires started to spread everywhere around it, the temperature in the air rising just from its presence. The four-tailed beast I guess the Wagaker is going all in Tasho slowly grasped at the wriggling handle of the Samhata, behind him countless shadows blurred, spreading out in every direction from the compound. As if that wasn't enough, Akria then looked to the side, slightly behind the four-tailed beast, another one rose from the foliage. A gigantic white horse with a dolphin's head. It has two pointed long horns to the sides of its head, and three shorter horns in front. Its most telling features were the five tails wriggling behind it, lashing out and snapping parts of the forest around it. Both of them are here, Akria muttered while shaking his head slightly. He narrowed his eyes as they seemed to glint with anticipation. Do you think we will be able to take them on? The second blade continued speaking while already stretching. It was more of a rhetorical question. It didn't really matter what his chances of taking on the tailed beasts were. That was also true for Tasho. Their job was to stall them, not to outright defeat them. The armies of the allied villages are likely hiding behind the tailed beasts for now. The first blade spoke as both he and Akira stared down the tailed beasts fearlessly. Both the four and five tailed beasts seemed to move in unison, all of their tails pointed to the sky, as energy gathered at the tips of their tails, forming a gigantic ball of chakra in front of their mouths. The gigantic arella had a ball of glowing red chakra, it seemed to be smoldering the atmosphere around it. Meanwhile, the horse seemed to have created a ball of compressed steam, which was also radiating enough heat to rival that of the apish four-tailed beast. They really do want to just wipe us out, it seems Tasho shook his head as he raised his hand. Tail beast lava bomb. Tail beast steam bomb. Two monstrous voices thundered through the entire mountain range, as their heads snapped in the direction of the two blades. The two gigantic orbs of power immediately compressed and started barreling forward, rolling and burning every tree that stood in between them and the Dark Brotherhood compound. At that moment, Tasho waved his hand and tilted his head. Then, both he and Akira cut their thumbs with the nail of their index finger, and tapped the ground at their feet at the same time. Summoning. 
Turbo Rashomon. Summoning. Turbo Rashomon. At that moment, six demonic gates rose from the ground to meet the attacks of the tailed beasts, as both of the blades braced for impact. An Aerank defensive jutsu that they had managed to scavenge off of a dead body which was found decapitated at the bottom of the sea. The jutsu was high in chakra consumption, but also extremely powerful. The tailed beast bombs collided with the first gate and passed through it without any issue, seemingly melting it on impact as both Akira and Tasho started sweating. The same was true for the second, and third, they were melted almost instantly on impact. Only on the fourth one was their resistance, but all it took was a few seconds of the chakra orbs pressing into the demonic gate to melt through it. And on the fifth one, they stopped completely. But that was nowhere near the end of it. In an instant, both the lava and steam orbs started expanding rapidly. In an instant, they engulfed everything that the tailed beasts could see from a distance. It was a raging storm of lava and steam, sure to melt through anything and anyone that was still within the Dark Brotherhood. Kemishin successful the Jinchuriki of the four-tailed beast from Shai, muttered as he slowly prepared to transform back into his regular form. But another voice stopped him. No way it was his companion and fellow Jinchuriki of the rock village, Han. The usually silent man was also in his tailed beast form, his gigantic horse body was constantly emitting a layer of steam, which threatened to melt the skin off the bones of everything that came close. Despite that, his voice sounded strangely perturbed. Huh. What's happened? Bashi muttered as he turned his gigantic gaze to what should have been the ruined remains of the Dark Brotherhood compound. As the steam and smoke died down, the two of them could clearly see a thin red barrier had appeared between the fifth and sixth Rashomon. The red light seemed to be in the form of a square which completely engulfed the entirety of the Dark Brotherhood. Shit, a ceiling barrier. Bashi shouted as he turned to his companion, only for his eyes to widen. Before they had even realized it, they were also engulfed in very similar formations, although at a much smaller scale. Rashi banged on the walls of the prison he found himself in with overwhelming force, but all of his efforts yielded nothing. The Four Red Yang Formation Back on the intact gate of the Dark Brotherhood compound, Tasho couldn't help but sigh in appreciation. The Four Red Yang Formation was the gift of the Uzumaki clan, and it was certainly a powerful technique. Despite tanking two tailed beasts simultaneously, the barrier didn't even budge or shake. The only problem was that it did require four people with cage level chakra pulls to raise and maintain it, making it quite literally the most taxing barrier formation ever. Now such a restriction meant nothing to the Yuzumaki, as all of them were insane in chakra levels. But things were trickier for the Dark Brotherhood. In no way did they have 12 cage level people on their side. But with the rather smart and innovative use of the chakra draining seal, they at least had 12 pillars that could uphold the formations. The ones around the tailed beasts weren't as strong nor as large. They were also somewhat misshapen, but that was because the pillars holding them up were made up of several kunai buried into the ground. The proper seals were placed on said kunai, and they were powered by the chakra of the students who had created them. They did require a lot less chakra thankfully, but the one around the compound was a complete barrier seal cast in a white area. It also needed a longer time to cast, which was why Tasho and Akira needed to buy a few precious seconds for it. Ha. I can feel my chakra getting drained. Here's hoping we can at least maintain this for an hour, Akira mumbled a bit before sitting down in a meditative position, cracking his neck and focusing on recovering his chakra as it was being drained. Even so, all of the collective chakra of the Dark Brotherhood is gone into this let's just hope that Saburo's intel is correct. Tasho shook his head before also sitting down and doing the same as Akira. The second blade tapped a seal on his wrist and took out a few food pills, before moving his mask slightly to the side, placing them in his mouth and chewing. At least I won't be getting hungry anytime soon. The immortal smiled and eyed the struggling tailed beasts in the distance, as the sixth still intact Rashomon gate disappeared. If you do go hungry, please bite the faces of our enemies and not mine. Thank you. Yeah yeah, stop yapping so much about it, it only happened once, and it was just some random bandit. Akira seemed to take offense to Tasho's words, but the first blade only shrugged. If you followed your diet plan properly, that wouldn't have happened. If you like talking shit so much, why don't I shove a funnel deep into your stomach, so you can shit through it, ha. Huh? The two continued their banter while the army of shinobi banged at the formations they had created, trying to free the tailed beasts. They were unsuccessful, to say the least. Things were going to plan for the Dark Brotherhood, at least for now. Ken was also already halfway there, he was almost past the land of grass, right at the border with the land of waterfall. He sighed as he smelt the opposition ahead, he climbed up a large hill, and on the other side was a gigantic lake. Ken could feel countless shinobi within that lake lying in wait. He could also feel a few rather specific chakra signatures, significant ones actually. A few cage and a tailed beast that's it. Ken shook his head as he spoke out loud to nobody. But he was sure the little spies that had been following him around heard his words. It was almost as if he had triggered an earthquake. In an instant, countless figures rose from within the lake. How the hell did he spot us? As expected of the world's strongest bounty hunter, huh? 
Even if he's a kid, many shinobi voiced out their frustrations as they stepped onto the calm lake and stared at Ken with narrowed eyes. This is where you die, you abominable brat. Lord Yui was in the middle of the lake too, speaking from behind the army of shinobi, as he hoped to finally see the death of the one that had caused the grass village so much shame. Oh, some old nobodies among you all too. So strange. Still, none of you have the right to step in the same arena as me. Ken shook his head before turning his masked face to the sky. What was the point of bringing so much cannon fodder over, Anoki? In the sky, the legless figure of a small old man lowered from above the clouds and huffed. TSK, don't get too complacent, today is the day you die red dot. You and the Dark Brotherhood you worked so hard to create. Anoki huffed in rage as a few figures appeared by his side. One was a tall man with spiky hair, he seemed to be floating on black dust or was it sand? Ken didn't really know. The other figure seemed to be a monk of sorts, Ken could clearly feel a tailed beast within him. The three of them didn't seem to want to attack right away. Using the cannon fodder to tire me out, huh? How useless I guess the show is starting, huh? Ken sighed and tapped the seal on his wrist, taking out a large and bulky sword. The Hiramekure, or the twin sword. A large blade with legendary chakra conductivity that had two hilts. The blade glowed an eerie blue as Ken decided to use its most important ability shapeshifting. In an instant, the blade started to shrink, and before everyone's eyes, the previously bulky double-edged sword turned into an exceedingly long one-edged blade. A long udachi, something that was certainly more in line with Ken's style. The shinobi looking at it couldn't help, but gulp, it looked like it could cut through scores of men with just one swing. Let's see how well the lot of you can dance. POV narration. Ken cracked his neck as his now thin blade shone a dangerous sparkling blue. It became even worse when the blind monster grabbed the second handle of the blade, and separated his long blade in two. He held them with their tips slightly above the ground, and pointed to his sides. They were both just as long, slightly thinner than a regular katana. Lightning rolled off of both of them as Ken's chakra charged and unleashed their full potential. The aura surrounding them felt dangerous to all of the shinobi that now faced him, but not one of them seemed to hesitate, all of them raising their weapons and preparing their jutsu. Their leaders had made it clear to them, that Ken was a danger to their villages, to their loved ones, and to their livelihoods. They needed to make sure that he was going to die there, and if they needed to give their lives to tire him down, they would do so without hesitation. If their lives could whittle down the monster in front of them, then it would surely secure a better future for their villages, right? At least that was what they kept telling themselves. Those were the words that kept repeating in their minds, on and on, it was an endless loop of affirmations that was not even entirely their own. Which was why Ken could sense it. The fear that seeped deep into their bones. They were just shinobi, doing what they were told was best, following orders blindly. But that didn't mean they fully knew the situation or understood why they needed to now face their deaths, therefore they couldn't help but feel fear. At least the majority of them were like that. There were also a few who were so brainwashed that their fear was overwhelmed by their pride. And they were the ones to attack first. Charge. The shinobi, although only a small percentage of the army, still numbered in the hundreds, and Ken sighed and simply cracked his neck when sensing them. He jumped once, twice, then dashed forwards as well, at speeds far exceeding that of his enemies. His elongated blades cleaved through scores of enemies, a blue aura of lighting extending from them with each slash, and cutting them down, before they could even scream out in pain, split in half while shouting in pride. Swords broke, blood spilled, and a blind swordsman gripped both of his blades harder, before immediately raising them over his head in a cross shape. That sudden move blocked three masked shinobi, that were trying to cut him in a downward motion with short blades. Sparks flew as the blind monster smiled underneath his mask. The ground behind him broke at that moment, with two more shinobi rising from it, their blades already pointed at his back, aiming to stab through his heart. Ken's leg immediately shot to the side, aiming a backwards kick at one of their arms with his heel, knocking both of the assailant's blades to the without even turning his head to them. Then the blades of the shinobi he was clashing with finally seemed to have had enough. They all snapped, and Ken's hands turned into a blur as his blades cut all of the shinobi in halves, as if with scissors. Shit. Fire release. Great fireball technique. One of the shinobi to the side spat out a ball of flame large enough to completely engulf Ken. But the blind assassin casually swiped one of his blades towards it, splitting it in half with a wave of blue ore, while his other blade decapitated the two men who had tried to stab him in the back. Shit. Don't use fire. You'll create a smoke screen, remember he doesn't have eyes, he doesn't need sight. One of the shinobi round them shouted out in a panic when noticing the slight steam that rose from the remains of that fireball. Ho. Oh. So they did their homework, huh? Ken couldn't help but tilt his head slightly, both to express his emotions, and to dodge a kunai that whizzed past his head. The dried up grass around him still burned from the fireball, but it likely wasn't going to spread too far. Wind release. Air bullets one shinobi to the side tried to use a jutsu as well, likely wanting to fan the flames in hopes of burning Ken even slightly. But he had found himself a bit too close to Ken, before the first air bullet even left his mouth, his head was cut off as Ken dashed towards the shinobi once more. 
Earth release. Rock grasp. Just as he decapitated a few of them, the earth rose and formed hands at his feet, gripping tightly and trying to hold him in place. But that was never going to work on someone who was permanently in sage mode like Ken. With his absurd strength, the blind monster completely disregarded the earth's bindings, breaking them without even trying and continuing with his carnage. Wind release. Vacuum blade. Immediately, a swordsman approached, an actual challenger. A man wielding a katana infused with wind, dashed in front of Ken and clashed blades with him. Locking both of Ken's blades with his own as the ground underneath him broke from the pressure. He seemed a bit more skilled than the rest, his blade sparking with the white ashore, while both of his hands trembled on the hilt, trying to not be pushed back by Ken's blades. The two of them were in a deadlock for a second, as the shinobi did his best to essentially hold back the monster they were facing. Water release. Water dragon bullet technique. To the side, several shinobi used that strength to form an attack. They molded the water in the lake behind them into dozens of small dragons, which immediately rushed towards Ken. And just as the dragons were about to reach him, he immediately tensed up putting more power into his hands. The other shinobi's arms seemed to break in an instant as the deadlock fell apart. Ken's blades then moved madly. Dragon Twister. With the two blades firmly in his grasp, the blind monster spun at a speed large enough to create a tornado so large that it reached the clouds. Plenty of people that were around him got caught up in it as well, and the water dragon seemed to get absorbed into it as well, managing to do no harm to their intended target in the end. The tornado ended not soon after Ken stopped spinning, it was already self-sustaining, but one downward slash using the momentum he had gathered from spinning, broke it apart in an instant. It also created a flying slash that split apart the earth and segmented it greatly, making the battlefield even messier than before, and even trapping some shinobi in the rubble. Bodies also fell from the skies, crash landing onto the ground. Some died, and some managed to break their folds. Some even got rescued by the Kazuki it seemed. The iron sand user had a limited storage of sand, however, so he could only help so many. To the side, a group of shinobi had finally finished their hand signs, and completed a large-scale jutsu. Earth release. Sandwich technique Ken's head turned to his sides as gigantic walls rose from the ground, and threatened to crush him. They were so big that Ken could feel them spanning hundreds of meters, it seemed that the shinobi were very serious about trapping him there, even if for a while. Or maybe they actually thought such a thing could crush him. Unfortunately, much to the surprise of the shinobi that had used the jutsu, Ken made no move to rush out of it or block it. Instead, he dove headfirst into one of the walls as they closed shut with a loud bang, creating a shockwave that blew away all of the dust that had gathered. Shit. He's gone into the ground. Sensory shinobi, try to track him down. Dust rose all around them as the gigantic dome of the earth stood there unmoving, all of the shinobi tensed up, as they could only gulp and wait for their opponent's appearance. Those that had sensory abilities tried their best, but they couldn't possibly find their world's most infamous assassin so easily, now could they? Keep your eyes peeled. He'll strike at any moment. The shinobi shouted as more and more of them stepped onto the already bloody shores of the lake. But as one lucky shinobi stepped onto the shore, he felt the waters behind him shift. Looking back, his gaze was filled with horror as he looked back. H is on the lake. Everyone's heads immediately snapped towards the middle of the lake, where Ken's figure stood silently, his two thin blades now steadily fastened onto his back, underneath his cloak. His presence was so fleeting that he blended in between the panicking shinobi who were still hesitant to face him. I'm sorry for what I'm about to do. Ken's voice sounded almost regretful, it was also quiet, as only a few of the shinobi around him had heard it. Instead of facing off against the powerful assassin, they all immediately turned their tail and ran, jumping from wave to wave as the waters rose, while Ken made some hand signs. Stop him. Sin cried. But it was already too late, Ken brought his hands together one last time, just as a few kunai and flaming shuriken were about to reach him, and in an instant, a wave of water rose up all around him. The shinobi watched in fear as the wave around Ken grew and grew, before suddenly rushing outwards, taking an odd shape. Water release. A thousand feeding sharks. The wave turned into an army of small water sharks, that tore into the hundreds of shinobi still around Ken. Blood smeared the waters and limbs flew everywhere, as now even the people above realized that they needed to get involved. Dust release. Detachment of the primitive world technique. From above, a gigantic white pillar rushed towards Ken, aiming to interrupt his technique. The blind monster had already expected it, so he rolled off to the side, blending into the water, as the Tsuchikage's jutsu formed a large empty space in the middle of the lake. And what happened when such a space was created in a body of water? That's right. A whirlpool. A sizable one at that. It immediately seemed to be undoing Ken's gigantic shark waves, and the shinobi that stuck to the water, seemed to be able to resist its pull by running away constantly. Ken smiled underneath his mask as he made a few more hand signs. Combination Jutsu. Thousand Feeding Sharks Whirlpool. The blind assassin shamelessly decided to combine his jutsu with the whirlpool that Anoki had created, causing the small old man's eyes to whiten. 
Sharks immediately formed in the water and started spinning in the same direction as the whirlpool, strengthening it and making it larger and larger. Shit. Everyone get away from the lake. But Tsuchika spat out that order as he considered sending another dust release to undo that combination jutsu, but he knew that at that point, Ken could just continue using the whirlpools to his advantage. And if the situation were to turn into a battle of endurance, Anoki was unsure if he would win with the absurd consumption that came with dust release. In the end, he was forced to watch as hundreds upon hundreds of men were shredded apart by water and sharks, and the entire lake became a death trap. As shit the shinobi that were on the shore all seemed to take a step back, unsure what to even do at that point. As so that's the power of the strongest bounty hunter. Shit, and he's still so young. Many voiced out their concerns, now even the more brainwashed shinobi were starting to have doubts about their chances of even tiring out the monster they were tasked to deal with. They had started with close to around 2000 shinobi from different villages. Now they were down to less than half of that. Their fighting spirit had also dwindled significantly as they now looked at Ken, who was seemingly unaffected by the whirlpool just sitting on one of his sharks near the middle of it, spinning in place. The lake had mostly turned red in the blood of their comrades, and it was only a matter of time before they joined their friends in the afterlife, if they actually tried to go after Ken again. Shit seems he's very proficient in water release. We need to get rid of that source of water. The third Kazuki had scowled as iron sand rose around him, forming spikes and pointing at Ken. But before he could attack the blind monster, the Tsuchikich raised one of his arms and waved it dismissively. Don't bother attacking him there despite his demeanor, he spoke in a frustrated tone. He then turned towards the monk who was floating on some sand to the side. Oi, Jinchuriki. Get rid of that lake. Anoki shouted that order coldly, he then signed to the shinobi below to not act and rush into the waters anymore. As you wish. The Jinchuriki smiled before his eyes changed color, turning from blue into a deep yellow, as sand started coming out of his body. Ken turned his head towards the sky at that moment, feeling the surge of chakra and shaking his head. The Jinchuriki is finally joining in, huh? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. Hunter Hat Salute.